Hello and welcome to the Dementia Care Aware Medical Legal Partnership Network training on advanced care planning. I want to give a special thanks to Michelle Panlilio from UCLA Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program, Sarah Hooper, the Executive Director of the UCSF UC Law Consortium on Law, Science, and Health Policy, and Dr. Catherine Eubank, Professor in the Division of Geriatrics, UCSF, for developing the asynchronous advanced care planning module for Dementia Care Aware that this video is based on. This presentation was developed with the input and support of the Dementia Care Aware statewide medical legal partnership network. These are our legal and clinical partners across California, and we are very grateful for their efforts in developing legal trainings like this one. My name is Elizabeth Peters. I am the Medical Legal Partnership Attorney at the UCSF UC Law Consortium on Law, Science, and Health Policy. After this video, the goal is that you can recognize the purpose and components of advanced care planning, be able to name three kinds of legal decision supports a patient commonly needs, and that you feel able to initiate a conversation about advanced care planning with patients and provide resources for them. Advanced care planning is the process that supports adults at any age or stage of health in understanding, documenting, and sharing their goals and preferences for near-term planning, long-term planning, and end-of-life planning. Advanced care planning refers to the process of naming medical and financial decision makers and completing the necessary legal documents. So who should do advanced care planning? The simple answer, all adults. All adults, regardless of age, should do advanced care planning. It's not a one-time process. Advanced planning documents and decisions should be revisited. For people with cognitive impairment, dementia, or otherwise at risk of incapacity, it's even more important that they engage in advanced care planning. Advanced care planning has been shown to reduce stress, anxiety, and depression among patients and caregivers. It can also reduce unnecessary healthcare costs and unwanted medical treatment at the end of life. The primary components of advanced care planning that are important for every patient to have and or complete are one, a healthcare agent and a healthcare power of attorney, a, finan a financial agent and a financial durable power of attorney, and a representative payee or a VA fiduciary. And these are all components that I will go over in more detail. To help illustrate the benefits of advanced care planning, I wanted to introduce you to the case of Mrs. C. Mrs. C is an 82-year-old woman diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia. She has a history of wandering and becoming distressed when she forgets where she is. She lives at home with her daughter, M, who is her primary caregiver and her IHSS worker. They live in an apartment and do not have other family to assist. After being found wandering and delirious after leaving the home while her daughter was getting groceries, Mrs. C's hospital discharge team thinks she needs to be placed in a facility. One available facility is actually refusing to admit her until they have a financially responsible party who can sign her in. Mrs. C has never named anyone as a financial agent. So some questions for you to consider about Mrs. C are, does she need advanced care planning? And what elements of advanced care planning might she need? Advanced care planning is important at any stage of life and it gains significance in situations such as dementia where patients are expected to lose their ability to participate in decisions about their care. For Mrs. C, there are different issues in her case that show just how important advanced care planning is for her. The first issue is, does Mrs. C have capacity? Capacity is decision specific and context sensitive. In California, there is a presumption that all adults, even with a diagnosis like Mrs. C of Alzheimer's, have legal capacity for decision making unless and until proven otherwise. Capacity, like I said, is context sensitive and decision specific. Another issue for Mrs. C is the progressive nature of her illness. She needs to complete the necessary documents while she can still participate in decisions and make known her preferences for long-term care and end-of-life care. For instance, does she want certain life-sustaining treatments or not? She needs to maximize her ability to participate in decisions. Another issue for Mrs. C is the nature of the decisions that need to be made for her needs and her care. 
Decisions she needs to make may be what we call personal care decisions or medical decisions or financial decisions. For instance, consent to ad admission to an assisted living facility is often considered a personal care decision, which often is under the purview of a financial decision maker. For medical decisions, if she's not able to make decisions on her own, she will need to name a healthcare agent or supporter. Without advanced care planning completed, Mrs. C faces the risk of probate conservatorship, which is a decision-making intervention and should be thought of as a last resort. It does not create new resources or assets for her. It is a court process that can be quite lengthy and expensive and cause distress to both the person being conserved and their family or friends. If someone completes advanced care planning, this can help avoid the need for conservatorship and help streamline their transitions of care. Next, I'm gonna review some different advanced care planning tools and talk about how they might aid Mrs. C. I'm gonna review three types of medical decision-making tools and types of medical decision-makers who can be named in different advanced planning documents. If someone has capacity, they can create an advanced healthcare directive. This is one of the most important advanced care planning tools. An advanced healthcare directive is a legal document that typically has two parts. The first part is the power of attorney for healthcare, where the patient chooses a healthcare agent. This healthcare agent is a trusted person who can make decisions for the person either immediately or when they can no longer do so themselves. The power can be broad or limited. Additionally, if someone is able to name a backup agent, that's really important as well. Oftentimes a person will name a spouse or partner and then they never revisit their planning documents. And then at the point when the document takes effect, that partner or spouse might not be available. So it's helpful to name a backup decision maker. If someone cannot name more than one person or even any person, they should still complete the document. The second part of an advanced healthcare directive are the instructions on the patient's desires for types of care or interventions they do or do not want. This part is sometimes called a living will. Additionally, sometimes an advanced healthcare directive is referred to as a power of attorney for healthcare. So it's important to distinguish a power of attorney for healthcare from a durable power of attorney for finances. I'm going to review a durable power of attorney for finances in a couple of slides. If a patient mentions that they have completed a power of attorney, it is important to clarify if they mean for healthcare, finances, or both. An advanced healthcare directive needs to be witnessed by two people or notarized to be legally valid. There are also supporters in a supported decision-making agreement. This is new to California as of 2023. So this is a person named to support another person in decision-making. Unlike a person named in an advanced healthcare directive, they cannot make decisions for a person or sign any forms for them. Their role is to support the patient in decision-making. Supported decision-making agreements are a brand new tool in California, and it's not very clear yet how it will apply to people with dementia. So we always recommend that people have an advanced healthcare directive and financial decision-making tools like a power of attorney for finances. Supported decision-making agreements could be helpful in the early stages of the disease, but it's not a replacement for the other tools I'm going to discuss. Another type of healthcare decision-making tool is the PULSE. So the Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. This document is appropriate for those nearing the end of life with serious illness or frailty. It's a medical order and can only be completed by a licensed medical professional. This gives orders around specific medical interventions at the end of life. Critically, it does not name an agent for healthcare decisions. This form, if people have seen it or think they've seen it, is often bright pink. So to summarize, a patient can name trusted people to act as healthcare agents or supported decision makers. These trusted people don't need to be family. These medical decision making tools, like an advanced healthcare directive and a supported decision making agreement and a post, give people the opportunity to document their goals and their preferences for healthcare. Naming agents and surrogates for healthcare is very important for the well being of a person who has cognitive impairment or dementia. Critically, however, these healthcare decision makers cannot address all the needs a patient may have. So people need to complete financial decision making tools and name financial and legal surrogates. 
there are different types of legally recognized financial surrogates. The most important type of financial decision-making tool is a durable power of attorney for finances. This is a legal document where a person names an agent to make financial, property, or other legal decisions on behalf of the person. It should be completed with the help of an attorney to limit the opportunities for the document to be abused. The powers given to an agent in this form can be broad or limited, and critically, in California, there are no default financial surrogates. An agent and a power of attorney for finances can often do a lot more than simply handle someone's bank account. They can be given the power to, for instance, talk to a landlord or an agency. They can be given the power to assist in determining how to pay for long-term care. In some cases, they can be given the power to gift a house or other property for the benefit of the person. The agent and a power of attorney for finances can be given the power to act immediately or only when the person does not have capacity. The form itself is going to specify this. And this document needs to be notarized to be legally valid. I want to reiterate that the power of attorney for finances is a tool that can be easily abused. So it's important that somebody complete this document with the help of an attorney. Another type of financial decision maker that a patient may need is a representative payee, the Social Security Administration, or a Veterans Administration fiduciary. Neither of those agencies recognize a durable power of attorney for finances. So for the Social Security Administration, a rep payee is a person or an organization approved by Social Security to manage someone's benefits, such as retirement benefits, disability benefits, spouse and dependent benefits. Social Security Administration allows advanced designation of payees. So this means that a person, while they have capacity, can submit to Social Security Administration a list of people that they would want to act as their payee when they don't have the ability to manage their own benefits. Like a Social Security representative payee, there is a Veterans Administration fiduciary. A Veterans Administration fiduciary is specific to people who receive benefits from the Veterans Benefit Administration. Like a Social Security Administration representative payee, they receive the benefits on behalf of the person to use those benefits to support that person. The VA fiduciary can only be named after a veteran is no longer able to manage on their own. It's important to note that even if someone has a VA fiduciary or a Social Security representative payee, they should still complete a power of attorney for finances. The representative payee and the VA fiduciary's power is limited to the specific stream of income. So if someone needs assistance applying for a public benefit, the representative payee or a VA fiduciary cannot assist with that, but the agent and a power of attorney for finances could. Another type of legal and financial decision-making tool is the supported decision-making agreement. This is where a person can name another person to act as a supported decision maker. A supporter in a supported decision making agreement is not making decisions for a person or signing any forms, but they can assist the person in decision making. Like I mentioned before, supported decision making agreements are a brand new tool in California, and it's not very clear yet how it's going to apply to people with dementia. As I mentioned earlier, we always recommend that people have an advanced health care directive, and these other types of financial decision-making tools in place, like a power of attorney for finances and naming an advanced Social Security representative payee. Supported decision-making agreements can be really helpful in the early stages of dementia, but it's not a replacement for these other tools. So how can these forms of advanced care planning assist Mrs. C? Even patients in a safety net system or who are low income should still appoint healthcare and financial decision makers. Children and spouses, they have no automatic right to make decisions for parents or spouses regarding money, property, or health. They need to be given that authority with legally valid documents. So in Mrs. C's case, while she has capacity, she should complete an advanced healthcare directive. She can talk with her medical team and her daughter. It gives her a chance to iterate the types of care she wants or does not want and who she trusts to make decisions on her behalf for her health care needs. She can explain in the document her long-term health care and end-of-life preferences. 
While she has capacity, Mrs. C can complete a durable power of attorney for finances. The person named in that document could then help figure out how to pay for her long-term care or if she's eligible for other services like food stamps or more in-home care. If she needs to go into an assisted living facility or nursing facility and she does not have capacity, a financial agent could admit her into a facility. Admission to an assisted living facility is considered a personal care decision, and that type of decision is not necessarily the authority of a healthcare agent. It's often within the power of a financial agent to sign that type of contract for assisted living facility or nursing facility and organize how to pay for that care. If Mrs. C wants her daughter M to have that ability to sign her into an assisted living facility or nursing facility, she needs to complete a power of attorney for finances. And importantly, doing these types of advanced care planning can assist Mrs. C by avoiding probate conservatorship. Probate conservatorship should be thought of as a last resort for Mrs. C. In naming medical and financial decision makers, she can hopefully avoid having to go through a really expensive, lengthy, and stressful process because she's named these surrogate decision makers in advance. So how can healthcare teams help with advanced planning? Providers, especially primary care providers, are often a resource that patients trust most to guide them, so you can help. You can let patients know that medical, financial, and legal planning is important to their future care, regardless of their assets. Healthcare teams can be the first step in getting a patient to complete advanced planning documents. Simply asking someone if they've named in legal documents somebody to act as their healthcare agent or a financial surrogate can start that process. So simply asking the patient, do you have somebody who can make financial decisions for you when you can't, or healthcare decisions when you can't is really important. You can ask them about their values and how they wanna be cared for as they age and as they experience cognitive impairment. You can ask specific questions, like if they have a trusted person who will help them and if they've completed their advanced directive or a power of attorney for finances, or if they have someone who could pay their bills for them if they are ill, questions like that. Crucially, you can refer them to resources in the community that can help them with the advanced care planning process and help them complete the necessary legal documents. So I wanted to leave you with two resources to help guide people in completing advanced care planning documents. The first is Law Help California. This is a website that offers resources on legal topics and how to find legal aid. People can search by county and topic to find the most relevant local resource. Another important resource for patients is Prepare for Your Care. This is a free website to assist with completing advanced healthcare directives, and it offers the template that they provide in multiple languages. Thank you for watching this training on advanced care planning. I hope that you found this training helpful. To learn more about the Medical Legal Partnership Network's education and training opportunities, please visit dementiacareaware.org slash MLP.